So, so we've we've been in this series uh, called Elephant in the Room. Has anyone has everyone or has anyone been here for all of them so far? Okay, all right, very nice, very nice. Um, your your toes are probably as 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 thin as paper because I've stepped on them so many times. Um, this this series is tough. Uh, this 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 is. <clears throat> This, this series is designed, we were asking the questions uh, that no one really wants to ask, right? We're, we're addressing the elephant in the room that everyone tries to ignore, and, and so far we've talked about alcohol, sex, money. Last week we talked about cursing, um, so, so if you want to go back and have your toes stepped on, you can go back and listen to that on, on our website, on, on YouTube. Uh, we're also on podcasts now, by the way, uh, so if you have Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts, you can listen to that, and uh, if, you tune, if you tune out today, you can catch back up on your way to work tomorrow. But uh, the, the elephant in the room that I want to address today actually kind of gets addressed quite often within the church, believe it or not. And, uh, but, but usually, typically, it's not, very communi- it's not communicated or addressed uh, in a very positive, in a very understandable way that actually means something to us, right? So, so, so this, this, this elephant in the room that I want to talk about today is eternity. Eternity, which shouldn't be an elephant in the room, but it is, but I'll get to that. <laughs> Eternity, life after death, eternal life. This is the elephant in the room today. And, 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 and um, you know, a lot of times this is brought up in church quite often, like I said, frequently. And, and usually we tend to walk away with a bigger elephant in our proverbial room <laughs> than when we walked in because of how it's been communicated over the years and how it's been addressed over the years. And, and, and typically, we usually feel worse about ourselves, worse about what happens at the end, uh, and, and typically, it's not something we look forward to. And uh, maybe there's a few of us in here today that are already like, I feel that pressure already, and I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> I promise it's, it's going to be encouraging, and it's going to be, uh, I'm, I, I hope to communicate a way that is, that, um, I hope to communicate this in a way that is, a positive light. Not, not that, you know, everything is, oh, everything's good and dandy, but I mean, we do have good news to share, right? This, this is in a place, this is a place of encouragement because we, we, no matter what you came in here with, with, we have good news to share with you today. And that is Jesus solves our every problem. And so this elephant in the room, there's an answer. The, the, his answer, the answer is Jesus but we have to, to take some, some, do some research, do the legwork, and, and, and see why this is an elephant in the room, see why we feel uncomfortable about this, and really just get uncomfortable with the fact, or get comfortable with the fact that we're uncomfortable. That's something we have to do, I think, when we are walking in relationship with Jesus and, and we're advancing and, and growing towards him, is we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because there are a lot of things that Jesus asked us to do that are way outside of our comfort zone. Can I get an amen? <laughs> There's a lot of things Jesus wants us to do that is way outside of our comfort zone, and we have to be comfortable in that uncomfortability in order to see growth happen, right? So so why is this an elephant in the room? Why is this an elephant in the room? Um, Death. (laughs) We we don't like talking about death. It's the same eerie feeling you get whenever the life insurance rep comes into the office, and it's like, hey, have you thought about dying recently? It's like, well, no, I didn't, but now I do, right? And it's like, let me plan my future without me. It's just, you know, it's it's kind of this eerie feeling of like, wow, that's, you know, I haven't thought about being disposable in a while, but, you know, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the reminder, you know? And we, we don't like talking about death, but that's exactly why I want to address it today, because whether you think about death or not, it is a part of life. You know, we, we're going through this series, and, and we're talking about alcohol, money, sex, and, and, and cursing, and, and these are elephants in the room that are, are, you know, pretty prevalent in today's culture, but they don't apply to everyone in the same way. However, death is something we will all encounter at one point of our, you know, along the journey at the, at the very end. So, so this is why we don't like talking about it, but it's also the same reason that we need to talk about it. It's because it, it's going to happen. We need to address the elephant in the room so we can understand what Jesus is trying to say about it. And so <clears throat> this, death, death is unavoidable, and it makes us really co- uncomfortable at times. Uh, but let's, let's jump out of our comfort zone today, uh, because I believe God has a message for us, and he, he, I, think, I think God wants to show us that eternal life is a good thing and should not make us feel uncomfortable. So as, as, as 
intense as the subject sounds, just hang tight with me, okay? I promise at the end it's going to be real good, and uh, God is going to speak to you in a way uh, that, that makes sense and in a way that is encouraging, in a way that makes you want to go out and just do something, okay? That's, that's what we're here to do. So let's address the elephant in the room. What happens when we die? What is heaven? Where is heaven? How do you get there? These are the elephants in the room. So let's turn to scripture and see what the Bible says about death, eternal life, heaven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's turn to John chapter three. John chapter three, if you're, if you're familiar in church, uh, you know that this is probably one of the most famous passages of scripture. However, it still has so much weight to it, and that's probably why it is as famous as it is. John chapter three, verse 630, or I'm sorry, uh, page number 638 in your fresh Bibles, if you're reading from there. Growing up, I wish my pastor would have done that for me, so I'm going to help you guys out. John chapter 3. Um, let me just give you some context while you turn there. Uh, this is just a buffer so you can get there in time, so I don't go off without you. But um, Jesus, imagine this. Jesus is the new guy on the block, right? J- Jesus just kind of started appearing out of nowhere. Uh, not really, but, um, you know, it's, it's been 30 years since, since, uh, since he was born, um, and, and all of a sudden, he just shows up on the scene. Jesus is the new guy on the scene. And, and we read in John chapter 2, he was at this wedding. It was beautiful. And he did this amazing miracle where he turned water into wine. And everyone's like, oh, oh, this Jesus guy, he's really cool. And, you know, Jesus is the goat or whatever people are saying now, right? The greatest of all time. And then later on, in, in halfway through that chapter, he goes to the temple and then starts flipping all the tables everywhere. And it's like, man, I don't know about this Jesus guy anymore. He's, he seems kind of like he's on, on the fritz, you know? Um, <clears throat> This guy's got some issues. So, so Jesus is, is kind of making his way, and, and he's making all the religious people mad, which is something that he's really good at. Uh, and so all the Pharisees, all the religious teachers, the religious leaders of the law are, are starting to, to notice this guy, and something, something's different about him. And, and I don't like the way that he's doing the, way that thing, the things that he's doing and the way that he's doing them. I don't know. So, so the Pharisees aren't, aren't too fond of Jesus, and... Most of the people are. So, so it's, they're, they're kind of, the Pharisees and Jesus are kind of butting heads here. Uh, and so there's this Pharisee named Nicodemus who's like, oh, listen, I just got to figure out who this Jesus guy is by myself. And that's where we kind of meet Nicodemus and Jesus in John chapter 3. And we'll go ahead and, and get there. It should be on the uh, large print of Fresh Bible behind us. Yes, there it is. Awesome. So let's read John chapter 3. We'll go all the way to verse, uh, we'll go to verse 17. John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish, leader, I'm, I'm sorry, Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, which means teacher. He said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Thanks for the image, Nick. (laughs) Verse 5, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Jesus said, you can't explain how, right? And then this is what Nicodemus says. How? It's like, really, are you listening at all? How are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? I assure you, we tell you what we know and what we have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And this is the most famous verse in all the Bible. Your kids know it upstairs. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, this is what gets chopped off a lot of the times, but it's so so good. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus shows us his mission, his whole purpose, Right? His, his whole reasoning for coming down to earth 
putting on flesh and bone, experiencing the things we experience in our life, emotions, pain, hunger, suffering, all these emotions, all these, he, he gets to experience these, and, and for what? Not so that we can have a good life and be cheerful or, you know, be happy, or not so he can make us be nice to everyone, not, not for our popularity, not for our status, not for our merit. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to what? To, to save it, to save it, because he loves us. Just as we sang in the song, he loves us. He didn't come to make us perish, but to give us life. Oh, but to give us life. And, and not, not just life that, that, that we experience for a mere 80 years on average on this earth. No, 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 a life that is eternal, a life that is so much better than, than any human life possible. The life of the spirit, the life that awakens our soul when we come into relationship with Jesus. That kind of life is what Jesus offers us. Not, not eternal life in our, our bodies. Uh, can you imagine that? Can you imagine having your knees that you have right now forever? My gosh, your back already hurts. It's only 1038, you know? <laughs> Jesus came not to give us eternal human life, but eternal life in our spirit. Not just to show us a better way of living, but to have us living forever. To give us life itself forever. This is the whole mission. This is the whole purpose of why Jesus came. So the, let's address the elephant in the room today. What is heaven? What is eternal life? Uh, how, how do we experience eternal life? W what happens after death? Is there really life after death? Is, is, uh, what does life after death look like? How do we obtain this? This is the elephant in the room today. So let's pray and let's jump right in. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you so much for this time that we have to experience your presence and your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your love. Thank you for your spirit that is so prevalent in this room today. Thank you for your presence that is so evident in this room today. God, I just, uh, I just pray you would speak to each and every single one of us. Address these issues in our hearts and our minds and these uncertainties about you and, and really just confirm things in us this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, all the church said amen. Um, have you heard this phrase before? We all have a destination. Has anyone heard this, heard this phrase before? I went to a, um, this is a phrase a lot of old pastors used to like scare a bunch of young kids. Um, I, I went to this youth conference one time. This is 100% a true story. I won't tell you the name of the conference because you might know it. But I, I went to this youth conference one time as a, as a youth leader. And I'll never forget this, this is like, you know, it's like a fun youth conference. They have like snowboarding and like, you know, tube things and, you know, snow cones and stuff. And like, it was fun. It was a whole week. I think it was, yeah, it was a whole week for all the kids and all the, all the teenagers. And, and they were having a blast. And, and like with these youth conferences, there's, there's these like church services that are hours long, you know? And uh, so this church service, I think, was scheduled to be like three or four hours. And, and yeah, that's like a typical Sunday here. So, yeah, not that big of a deal, right? Um, just kidding. I'm kidding. I, I worked. My wife yelled at me. Not yelled at me, but she is like, hey, babe, you, you really got to just limit your content. You're talking so much. So I'm trying today. Today, I promise I'm going to be focused, okay? Um, so she's helping me. It's good. She's helping you. Um, anyways, so, so the, you know, it's like it's four or five hour church service. And I'll never forget, you know, we're, we're singing these songs and it's like awesome. And, and they were Baptists. So, you know, they didn't, they didn't, you know, they just, they were swaying. Um, that's about the extent that they do. And that's like the equivalent to Pentecostals that are just like, oh, Jesus, yes. You know, so Baptist swaying, that's a good sign. You know, they're in it. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up Baptist. I can say that, by the way. So, um, we, we get, you know, I, I'm pretty sure they sang the song, How He Loves Us, Oh, How He Loves Us. You know, it was, it was so good. And uh, such, such an incredible time of, 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 of worship and, and watching the teenagers kind of understand the character and the nature of God and experience the presence. Of, it was awesome, incredible. And, uh, and then the pastor gets up there and, and with no emotion, he gets up there and he, he does this. He throws a grim reaper on the screen and he says, do you know where you're going to go when you die? I kid you not, 100% serious. We all have a destination. We all have a destination. Is it, yeah, this, this, <laughs> this, is, this is a good thumbnail for the YouTube um, uh, <laughs> picture. Um, do you know where you're going to go when you die? We all have a destination. And you've heard before that, that it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. But I'm here to tell you today that you're wrong. It's about the destination, not about the journey. 100% serious. And, he's, and he goes on for like half an hour instilling fear. Okay, you can take that off. That's, we don't want to, thanks. <laughs> um, don't want to get the wrong idea here. 
And he spends like half an hour instilling fear into the eyes and the hearts and the spirits of these kids. And, and talking. To, he spends more time talking about hell than anything else. And he's like, you know, all, this leads to hell. This leads to hell. This leads to hell. And you're going to hell. And everyone's like, oh my gosh. You know? And he spends half an hour just telling everybody how bad they are. And at the very end, he's like, but if you believe in Jesus, you can go to heaven. And I was like, really? That's, gosh, that's, what a, what a twist. He's like, so if you believe in Jesus, you can go to heaven. So let's pray. If you, if you want to receive Jesus today, would you lift up your hand? And I opened my eyes just because I was, I was, I, I had to. Every single one of the kids was like, <laughs> me, I want Jesus. I don't want to go to, you know. And as funny as that is, thinking back, I was like, oh my gosh. In the moment, I was like, Man, how easy is it for us to twist the gospel and manipulate this, this message of, of good news and, and, and put it in a way that is fearful? God doesn't operate in a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. God doesn't operate in a spirit of fear, yet the churches operate in spirits of fear to, to do what? To get you to go to heaven? Is that really what it's all about? And it was so funny. And then after, after this, I'm like thinking and pondering. I'm like, I can't even pray. I'm like trying to pray against what he's saying. Like, oh God, don't let it <laughs> control him, you know? And then this energetic college kid gets up and is like, wow, that was great, pastor. Who wants some pizza? You know, and they just go on. I was like, <laughs> what is happening here? All week was like that. It was awful. I was so blown away. I was like, man, I can't believe that this is what we've limited church to. This is what we've limited our relationship with Jesus to is, are you going to heaven or are you not going to heaven? You know, we all have a, it's like, man, it's so much more than just that. And I, I remember hearing the same message as, message as a kid and uh, we, we would call it fire insurance back then, fire insurance. And you would pray the prayer so you wouldn't go to hell. That's, that's what it is. And, and every week was the same message. Burn, you could turn or burn. And, um, and you had to, to pray the prayer. And so I remember as a kid, I was like, oh, you know, I, I'm trying to pray the, prayer, pray the prayer really fast. Jesus, come in my heart, forgive my sins, and uh, let me go to heaven. Because I was so afraid that I would not say amen in time and the rapture would happen. And I'd be like, no, I was so close, you know. <laughs> this is my mindset. This is how I grew up. This, and, and what's unfortunate is I think a lot of us grew up in that same way, or maybe if you didn't grow up that way, you've heard this kind of turn or burn message, and it's, it's, it's about the destination, and, and this, this is why it's become an elephant in the room, is, is because we're, just, we're so terrified of, of what's going to happen at the end. You know, and, and I, I remember as a kid too, like uh, going through my life, wondering, am I going to make it in? Am I going to make it in? And, you know, and every decision I made, I was like, I don't know if I made the right one. I, I, and and I'm, I'm thinking back, like God would, would not want his people to live in this fear of, am I going to get in or am I not? You know, and, and this is what the church for a really long time has, has taught us and instilled in us. And this is what a lot of us are, are, uh, have experienced as well. And so this is why it's an elephant in the room. This is why eternal life, eternity is an elephant in the room. It's because we're, we're scared of it. We're terrified. And let me just say, if hell is a greater motivator than Jesus, then we've got our priorities really messed up. Let me just say that, and I'll leave that there. You can take that with you and do whatever you want with it. But it's, it's not supposed to be like this. It's really not. It's, it's really not supposed to be like this. Heaven and eternal life should have never become an elephant in the room. These are gifts from God, not bargaining chips to make you do what he wants you to do. These are gifts from God. This was never God's intention when he gave us this gift of eternal life, when he gave us this gift of Jesus to come and spread the message of the good news. It's good news. It's good news. Nicodemus didn't come to Jesus running up to him like, Jesus, Jesus, how do I, how do I avoid hell? What do I got to do? How do I avoid your wrath? Ha! And he wasn't, he wasn't scared. He was like, no, no, no. I've got to get close to this Jesus because there's something that happens when you speak Jesus. There's something that happens when words come out of your mouth. It excites my soul. It, it awakens in my spirit, something about you when you look into my eyes just makes me come alive again, makes me come alive for the very first time. There's something about you, Jesus. I just, I got to get close to you. It was never, God, how can I, how can I run from this? How can I get away from hell? It was, it was always intended to be, God, how can I get close to you? This is what Nicodemus was, was this was his intention. It was never about avoiding hell but it was about being close to Jesus. 
And I don't think we understand the risk that Nicodemus took that night when he met Jesus. Because Nicodemus is a, is a Pharisee. Nicodemus is, is a religious teacher. So he's going to this, to this man named Jesus who people think is a heretic. Some people even think he's the prince of demons. He's Satan himself because he's just so different from what the Pharisees were doing that they just all they knew what to do was throw a label at him because that's all they ever did was throw labels at people. I won't go there. I, I told my wife I wouldn't. Okay, preach the message, Sean. Stick, stick to the script. What am I, what's my point? Oh, Nicodemus, when he risked his reputation, he risked his credibility, he risked his friendships to go see this man named Jesus. He risked his entire lifestyle, essentially, everything he knew and loved and worked to achieve in one meeting with a man that people did not like because he was so different. But that's why Nicodemus wanted to go see Jesus, because he was a different kind of teacher. He was a different kind of kind of rabbi. He 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 didn't throw labels at people. He didn't condemn everybody. He 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 went against against the grain when he operated his his ministry. And 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 Nicodemus, who was a religious teacher, was like, man, there's something, there's just something different about you, Jesus. The way you speak, the way you look into the eyes of people, the way that you get down in the dirt with people. There's something different about you. I, and, and it's clear, this is what the text says, uh, Nic- Nicodemus says, it's clear God is with you. It's, it's clear by the miracles you perform that God is with you. And I think Nicodemus's intention was, I'm a religious teacher. I'm trying to get close to God. Uh, clearly, this man is close to God. Let me go and see what he's doing right that I'm not doing right. And so I, I, I think that this is just my personal interpretation, but I think Nicodemus went to Jesus looking for a list of rules and commands and, 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 and guidelines to follow to get closer to God. And little did he know that he would leave Jesus finding out that, man, God did everything for him to be close to us. He went trying to figure out how he could be close to God, but found out, man, God is making a way to be close to us. And he was standing right in front of him the whole time. And to his surprise, he showed up to Jesus asking for a list of instructions and and all these things. And, And he was looking for a way, but little did he know he was talking to the way, the truth, and the life. It was in this very moment that that Jesus gives us the most memorable verse ever. Like I said, our kids upstairs probably already know it. That God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. This is his whole mission, to bring you from death to life. We were headed for perishing. That was our destination. But Jesus uh, changes our trajectory and, and, and has us heading towards eternal life. Now our destination is life through him. And I love how, how Jesus tells Nicodemus too. He's like, you know, there's, there's, there's two different kinds of life that you'll experience. There's two different kinds of life. There's human life, which humans can reproduce. And then there's spiritual life that only the spirit of God, only the Holy Spirit can give you. I love how Jesus distinguishes that there's a difference between the two, which can tell me that you can be living but not alive. Remember back in Genesis chapter 2 when, when God created Adam, he created him, he formed him from the dust, and it wasn't until that, that uh, God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and put the DNA of himself into his lungs that he became a living soul, a living creature, and he became alive. He was living, but without that breath of God, he was not alive. And this is the, distinguished, the, uh, uh, the, the, the difference that Jesus is trying to make. He's saying, look, You can be living this life, this human life, but be dead in your spirit. I'm here to change that. I'm here so not so that you can perish, but you can have eternal life. I love that. I love that he distinguishes the two. It's not just a life worth living. It's not just a life abundantly. It's not just a life temporary, but it is life eternal because I am the author of life. Jesus is the author of life. Outside of Jesus, there is no true life because he is the one who created it. Everything else is artificial. Everything else is imitation. Jesus is the author of life. Nothing can even begin to scratch the surface on how good this eternal life is with Jesus. 
And here's the beauty of it, is that God extends this offer of eternal life, not because of anything we've done, not because of how good we are or, or, or you know, how righteous we are. In fact, God sent his son into the world, that same world that hated him, the same world that spit on him, that same world that shoved a crown of thorns into his skull. God said, I don't, I don't care how far they go. And my love is for them because I love them so much. God so loved the world, me and you, even when we reject him. He so loves this world that he had to do something about it. He said, I, I don't want you to, to, to be on the path of destruction and perishing. I want you to be on the path of eternal life. God has done so much to, time and time again to, to prove his love for us. And you know what the church has done? We've limited it to this one question. How do you get to heaven? God does the, creates this massive redemption plan. This entire book that we're reading today is, is God's redemption plan for you and for me to bring him back to himself. And all we limit it the, the, our church services too is, are you going to get to heaven or not? Are you going to heaven or not? We've limited it to praying a prayer, <clears throat> raising our hand at the altar call and for the 13th time in a row, <laughs> all in the name of what? Heaven. Heaven. How do I get to heaven? This is the question we all ask ourselves, I think, at one point in, in, in time. And we restricted Christianity to just doing all the right things to get to heaven, right? I hate to burst your bubble today. Actually, this series is all about bursting bubbles. I really enjoy bursting your bubble today. I really do. <clears throat> Jesus didn't give Nicodemus instructions on how to get to heaven. Guess what he did? Jesus gave Nicodemus instructions on how to have eternal life. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. Can I burst an even bigger bubble for you? Eternal life is not about heaven. Eternal life is about Jesus. Eternal life is not about heaven. Eternal life is about Jesus. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> I love heaven. Believe me, I do. I am so excited for heaven. I'm so excited for my new bodies. My knees really need it. They crack every time they move. <clears throat> I'm so excited to see my loved ones, my, my grandparents. I'm really excited to see them again. I'm excited for the streets of gold. That sounds awesome. Sounds like a lot of fun. I'm excited for, you know, for the pearly gates and the mansions, depending on your theology, and heaven, whatever. I'm excited for all that, but... <clears throat> You know, I'm excited for a place where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more evil, no more sickness, no more school shootings, no more, no more human trafficking. I'm really excited for that. Believe me, I am so excited for heaven. But if you give me my loved ones, and you give me my streets of gold, and you give me the pearly gates, and Jesus is not there, guess what? This is not heaven anymore. It's hell. Give me everything heaven has to offer except Jesus. We're no longer in heaven. We're in hell. It kind of shifts your perspective a little bit on what we are looking forward to. Are we looking forward to this new life we get to live, the new earth, new heaven, new bodies, float around with the angels, you know, I don't know. Or are we excited to see our Father who welcomes us in with open arms, comes running out to meet us, saying, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm so proud of you. I'm glad my son is finally home. I'm glad my daughter is finally home. What are we really excited for when it comes to eternal life? Are we excited for heaven, or are we excited for Jesus? And I, again, I, I'm not trying to, to shame you or anything like that. I just want us to, you know, I just want us to entertain our minds a little bit. And, and, and I believe God wants us to enjoy all these things. I, I really do. I really do. But, but don't be so excited for heaven that you forget the person who makes it all possible. That's all I'm saying. Don't be so excited for the place that we forget about the person. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. If God's presence isn't present, that's not heaven. If God's presence isn't 
present, it's not heaven. It's not heaven. Heaven is where the throne of God is. Heaven is where the presence of God is. But without his presence there, it's not heaven. It's hell. And I won't go into too much detail today about hell, <clears throat> just because let's save our breath. <laughs> let's, let's not try to scare anybody today. But just know this, that, that hell is, 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 a, is, is not where God wants to send people. There, nowhere will you read, and, and, and nowhere in God's nature does he enjoy sending people to a place that is without him. But knowing that God gives us this free will, remember back in the garden, he gave them free will to say, uh, to, for Adam and Eve, and, and say, look, you can follow me and obey me and, and, and be with me, or you cannot. I'm, I'm not going to force you to do anything because that's not a genuine relationship, you know? And so he, he gives us this free will to choose him or to not choose him. It's, it's not, oh, do you want the pearly gates or do you want the fire of hell? It's, 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 do you want all of God or do you want none of God? And he'll respect that because he loves you and he cares for you and he values your opinion too. He's not going to force us to do anything. As good as it is for us to be with God, to be with Jesus, it would not be a genuine relationship if we, if we were forced to choose him. And so all, you need, all, all, all I'll say today about hell is that hell is the absence of God. And I don't think we can really understand that in its entirety because we've never experienced that. You may have felt really lost in your life. You may have felt really broken in your life, but God was still there. God, you may not have known it at the time, but God was still there keeping you through and, 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 and right behind you the entire time, waiting for you to turn around and just to come and see him. He was. He was there the whole time. But, but the absence of God, the absence of, of, of everything who God is, is a place we've never experienced in our life. I think uh, it was, uh, James 1.7 says this, every good thing comes from God above. <clears throat> so if, if, if we're in a place where we are eternally separated from God because we chose that, God, I, I don't want any part of you, that there is no good thing that exists outside of God. Not one good thing. I know we, we see cartoons that portray hell. Again, I said I wouldn't get into it. That's all right. I've got a little bit of time. Um, <clears throat> we see these cartoons that, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, Sin City. Come and play the casinos and the slots and drive a really long Cadillac. I don't know. Uh, that's, that's not what it is. No good thing exists outside of God. That's the reality of, of, of life without God. In fact, it's, it's not even life at all. There is no life outside of God. So that's, that's, that's all that is. And, and, and God, God, does not, uh, God does not enjoy s- sending people to hell. He's not, he's not ready and, and willing, like, ah, he's, they're not going to choose me, and I'm going to blow the trumpet, you know, and, and he's going to send us away. That's not, what, that's not God's nature. It actually breaks his heart that we're not with him. But, but where, where God's presence isn't present, that is not heaven. So, so, so be excited for eternity in heaven, really do. Be excited for a new heaven, a new earth, and the streets of gold, but don't let those things overtake your excitement for to be in the unhindered presence of God. Be excited for, um, um, you know, um, for, but for the right reasons. Be excited, but for the right reasons. You know, heaven is not a reward for good people. It's a gift for bad people. Eternal life is not a reward for good people. It's a gift for bad people. Eternal life, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the presence of God is not a reward for good people. It's a gift for bad people. It's, it's a gift for you and me. We need Jesus. Outside of him, we are nothing. We are nothing. And so we, we, need, to, we need to receive these gifts with gratitude and excitement, but not entitlement. Not saying, I'm going to do all the right things. I'm going to get to heaven and I'm going to have my mansions and it's going to have, I don't know, whatever. We need to receive these with excitement, but not entitlement. Maybe you're on the flip side of of how you feel about eternal life. and Maybe you're not necessarily, maybe you're, you're kind of scared of eternal life. Like, is that allowed to, as a Christian? Are you allowed to be scared of eternal life? You know, is that a sin? Um, it's okay, hey, I felt this way before. But, you know, it's, we, we ask the question, uh, especially like if you're an introvert or, or uh, antisocial, and you're like, excuse me, how long did you say this party was? Forever? Okay. What's the other option again? You know, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. 
We know we can ask the questions like, I, I've asked these questions myself. Oh, are we gonna get bored in heaven? Forever is a long time. <laughs> are we gonna run out of things to do, you know? Is, 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 am I gonna get tired of the same old, same old, same old? Is it just gonna be a long church service? Even if it was, Jesus is a way better preacher than I am. So just to say that. But you know, these are the questions that kind of come across our mind from time to time. I just wanna say it's okay to ask those questions. I've asked those questions. I still ask those questions sometimes. And I think that these questions aren't too big for our big God. Don't think they are, but, but, but um, just, just understand that God is a really creative God. God is a really innovative God. God is a really good God, and He's been working on this, this, this plan for us for eternal life for a really, really long time. I, I, I just want to assure you today that we can't understand eternity. We can't understand forever, and I think that's what scares us more than anything. Because you're already, some of us are already looking at our watch, like, when's this, you know, church going to be over so I can go to the buffet? So, so for a clock that never has hands that, you know, finally you know, an alarm clock that never goes off, you know, time forever, that's, that's a little scary for us. And I get it. Our, our small minds can't comprehend our big God. But I can tell you this, if we, if we trust in him and just know that he is good and everything he does is good, then we can be confident that yeah, I don't know the answers, but I know that it's going to be good. I know that eternity with, with Jesus, with the savior of our souls, with the creator of all things, I get to be face to face with him. Tell him how much he means to me and he can tell me how much I mean to him. It's gonna be good. So, so don't worry about those, those things. I, I get it and, and we're allowed to think like that from time to time, I think. But God is a, is a really, really good God. And we shouldn't be scared of eternity. We shouldn't be scared of eternal life. We shouldn't be worried about it. In fact, it's, it's, the, it's the fulfillment of, or I'm sorry, heaven is the fulfillment of the promise of eternal life. Life after death is the fulfillment of the promise of eternal life. These are things we should be excited for. These are things we should be ecstatic and, and, and just, um, we can't wait to get there with it in its own time. Um, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. I'll, I'll read this really quick because I think I've got some time. I'm a little over, but that's okay. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting verse 13. It says, For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, well, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we've said, God raised, God raised Christ from the dead, but that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we are, be, we are to be more pitied than anyone in the world. I'm gonna read that verse again. If our hope in Christ is only for this life that we live here, we are to be more pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came to the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead began, has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. This, this, is our, this is our promise. We can cling to the promise of the resurrection, that it's not going to be boring. It's not going to be, uh, we're not going to run out of things to do, but, but cling to this promise of the resurrection that, that gives us hope, that says, look, this suffering in this life is not the end. This, this, suffer, this, 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 um, this pain I'm going through is, is, is not the end. That I, there is a, there's, a, a, there's a better place for me with Jesus himself. I'm excited for that. The, the, we get to cling to the hope of the resurrection that says, look, we're just visitors on this earth. We're just visiting. We're, our, our, we're not made to just pay bills and die. Paul said, if, if, if our hope for Jesus is only for this life, what good is that? Just do whatever you want. But there's a hope that lasts beyond this life that we get to cling to. 
that helps us go through the hard times of this life. I get to cling to this promise and move forward another day knowing that life does not stop at death. And I've got some good news for us today too, that life doesn't start at death either. Eternal life with Jesus starts right now. Right now. Jesus didn't say, um, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life when they die but they, they should have eternal life period now here the Holy Spirit will come and give you life right now we don't have to wait till the end but it starts right now it starts today so eternal life is with Jesus today so here's the challenge I want to, I want to give us don't focus on heaven so much that you miss out where God has you right now. Because God has you alive and breathing for a purpose still, and he wants to use you to spread his message across the whole world of his love for everybody. So don't be so excited for heaven that you just disregard right now. Right now is important. Right now is important. But also don't focus so much on today that you forget that we're just visiting, that we're not home with our Father yet. So don't be so focused on heaven you forget about now, but don't be so focused on now that you forget about heaven. Because eternal life starts when we decide to follow Jesus in that very instant. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't hesitate. One day Jesus will come back and get his bride, you know, take us home and we'll be with him forever in a place where there's no more sickness, no more sin, no more separation. He'll wipe every tear from our eye. This is the promise we get to hold on to, and it's a good one. It's a really, really good one. So what is eternal life? This is the elephant in the room. What is eternal life? Simply put, eternal life is life with Jesus. Eternal life is life with Jesus, but it doesn't, it doesn't start later. It starts right now. It starts right now. So let's stand up. Let's jump up on our feet really quick. I told you I'd be on time. This is good. This is good. Thanks, babe. I want us to walk out of here with, with this promise in our head that this, this, this life will end our, our, our human bodies will come to an end, but our spirit will never die. And we can place our trust in Jesus and he makes our spirit come alive. And though our bodies may fade away, we will get to live with him and be in perfect union, be in perfect harmony, be in perfect communion. The way we were designed to be with God we get to do that with Jesus. And nothing will ever separate us again. So, so as we go out into this world, we've got a mission. The, the, the world is, is lost and broken and yeah, maybe their destination, if you wanna use that word, don't use that word actually. But maybe the, the path they're headed on is towards destruction, is towards perishing, Jesus' greatest, uh, great commission, uh, it says, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. So we've got a challenge. We've got a, we've got a, we've got a task at hand. That we, eternal life is not just for us. Eternal life is for everyone around us. And we've got to share this good news and not keep it all bottled, bottled up inside. But man, when we get to see people come alive, I hear testimonies, I see testimonies all the time of, 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 of people in our church that have experienced the goodness and the presence of, of Jesus for the very first time. And they're like, look, I've never come alive like this before. This is incredible. I want to I wanna get that experience. I want, I want people to experience that, that true abundant life that lasts more than just the 80 years we're on this earth, but man, eternally. So that's our task at hand is to 
They go out and, and, and tell people about God's love for them, just so vast, so deep, so wide, and it never ends. So let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, so much for your love for us. Thank you so much for your sacrifice for us over 2,000 years ago that made this moment even possible. Thank you that we don't have to just follow a bunch of rules and, and be good enough to be with you. <laughs> but in our brokenness, in our sin, in our destruction, you came to be with us right where we are. Down in the dirt to pick us up and lead us into the paths of righteousness. God, we're so grateful for this gift of your Son. We're so grateful for the gift of your Holy Spirit. I pray that it rests on each and every single person as we walk out of here. But God, more than anything, I, 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 want, us to, I want us to choose you for the right reasons. I, I don't want to create a bunch of false toxic relationships with you where we only get something, we're only in it to get something from you, but that we choose you for the right reasons. Heaven hasn't convinced us to choose you. Hell hasn't convinced us to choose you. But how much we love you has convinced us to walk in your ways, to walk in your footsteps. We thank you that you've made it possible that we even have a choice to make. And if there's anyone in the room who maybe you've chosen Jesus for the wrong reasons years ago and you've been following him to get to heaven, or maybe you've been following Jesus for what you can get from it, I want to give you the opportunity today to, to follow him again for the right reasons. Follow him just because you love him. Follow him because you're, you're thankful for, for everything he's done for us. And it's not the prayer, it's not the hand raise, it's not the fear, but it's the love that we get to choose. I want to make sure you have that opportunity to do that today. And it looks like just choosing him walking out of here and saying, God, I'm going to choose you. I'm not going to choose this world anymore. I, I want to choose to follow you. That is the greatest decision we can ever make. So if that's you today, I want to encourage you to do that before you leave this room. Have a heart to heart with God right now. I can feel his presence moving in somebody. leave this room without choosing Jesus. He loves you. The whole reason you're here today still breathing is because he loves you. He made a way for you to hear this message. He made a way for you to, to get here this morning. He loves you so much. And he did all this for you. So let's, let's choose to, or let's make the decision to choose him as we walk out of here today. God, we're grateful for your text and your, your scriptures and, and the authors you've inspired to, to capture these, these moments in history that, that happened that are so vital to understanding your character and your nature. We thank you for this. We thank you for your spirit moving in us, giving us wisdom and understanding to, to take this and, and go out into the world with it. God, we love you so much. We praise you for all of who you are, and we choose you today. In Jesus' mighty, wonderful, powerful, beautiful name, amen and amen.